Calm down, Edward. Edward, Edward, calm down. Just, just say it again. It, that was weird. They sprouted legs. Factories don't sprout legs. What? Call it, call it what you will, but they're gone. Okay. How many of them? No, I, I never heard that before either. All right. Bye, Edward. Germany has taken the Soviet Union's third largest city and has its second largest surrounded. And this week begins the drive for the largest, Moscow. This week begins Operation Typhoon. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the resistance in Yugoslavia formed the Republic of Užica, the first region of German-occupied territory to be liberated. The Germans were mopping up Ukraine after taking Kiev, but began pulling troops away in the north and the south for the coming drive on Moscow. The Japanese began to surround Changsha last week, and this week they enter the city. They first send in the plainclothes Hayabuchi detachment, but these guys are, are just slaughtered. That is also the fate of the regular troops that breach the city the next day. Continuous rain has prevented the Japanese from bringing in heavy artillery and tanks to the battle for the city. And so by the 30th, they are forced to retire, taking heavy casualties as they do so back towards the Xinjiang River. In fact, by a couple days from now, the Chinese will have pushed them back as far as Yue Yuang, the Japanese starting point, and the Japanese will have taken 41,000 casualties. It looks like we're going to see a great many more casualties than that in the near future in the Soviet Union. For on October 2nd, Operation Typhoon begins. This is the German drive towards Moscow. Adolf Hitler announces this day, Today begins the last great decisive battle of the year. At last, we have created the prerequisites for the final tremendous blow, which, before the onset of winter, will lead to the destruction of the enemy. Actually, the night before, he issues a proclamation to be read to the troops that, in barely three months, you have taken over 2,400,000 prisoners. You have destroyed or captured 17,500 tanks and over 21,000 guns. You have downed or destroyed on the ground 14,200 planes. The world has never seen anything like that. Which may well be true, but you know, they still haven't won. Dr. Heinrich Hoppe, who's been with the spearheads of the operation since June 22nd, writes that in spite of such staggering losses, east of the Meja, the Russians prepared a strong system of trenches, bunkers, tank traps, and barbed wire entanglements, brought up supplies and gathered their strength to stand against us once more. We had to sit helplessly and listen to stories brought back by our patrols of the rapidly developing Russian defensive system, and to read reports from our Luftwaffe spotter aircraft, which saw the movement towards the front of fresh troops, guns, and supply trains. We know from the past few months, the offensives by Army Group Center depend on the Panzer thrust, but while there may be a fair amount of tanks, they have been, for the most part, in constant combat since June 22nd, which has compromised them as a force. And there's this. Even in the second half of September, once Typhoon had been ordered, their redeployment was a real headache. Army Group Commander Fedor von Bock has three Panzer groups given to him, but two of the three were split between fighting up near Leningrad and down in Ukraine. And those were long, drawn-out campaigns that they were actively fighting. Just getting them concentrated for Typhoon ruins any rest and refitting time and subjects them to ever more wear and tear. Although an exact figure for overall losses by late September is not available, Panzer Group II reported a loss of 30-40% to 40 of its wheeled transport by September 20th. Nevertheless, at 5.30 a.m. October 2nd, Typhoon begins with a huge artillery bombardment. The ground and aerial assaults followed and immediately break through the Soviet positions. Panzer Group 4 advances 15 kilometers the first day. Panzer Group 3, 20. And at headquarters, Bach is elated. This is success on the level of June 22nd. On the 3rd in Berlin, Adolf Hitler gives his first national address since Barbarossa began. On the morning of June 22nd, this greatest struggle in the history of the world began. Today, 
I can state that everything has gone to plan. I may say today that this opponent has already broken down and will never rise again. By that evening, both Hermann Hotz and Erich Huppner's panzers had advanced a full 50 kilometers into the enemy, and Heinz Guderian is advancing from the south along one of the few all-weather sealed roads in the country towards Orel. But if they're advancing in the center, they are not doing so in the north. By the end of September, Georgi Zhukov's forces are still stuck in Leningrad, sure, but not nearly as jammed in as Hitler and Army Group North Commander Wilhelm von Lieb would like. The Neva River defenses are still intact, as well as those in the southern suburbs, and the Finns have not attacked from the north. Zhukov's iron will had produced a miracle on the Neva, and Leib clearly understood he had lost his best opportunity to seize Leningrad. And, as both sides licked their wounds and counted their casualties, they prepared to resume operations, knowing full well that, since Army Group North had failed to achieve its Barbarossa missions, struggle would inevitably continue. The active fighting has died down, but when it flares up again, Leib will not have the resources he did before. Hepner's 4th Panzer Group has left for Army Group Center. Leib has only the 39th Panzer Corps and the 8th Panzer Division left as armor. The Soviets have defended the city against active attacks for 50 days, the region since July 10th, and even launched September counterstrokes. And you can see the effect of the desperate defense. In July, the Germans advanced 5 kilometers a day on average less than half that in August, and just 1.2 kilometers a day in September. But just because the Soviets have, for the moment, stopped the Germans, make no mistake, the city is in grave danger. In the south, it's Odessa that's in grave danger. Well, and the Crimea once the Germans take Perikop the 27th. In fact, the German advance towards Crimea convinces Stavka to evacuate Odessa and join the Crimean defense. On the 2nd, the evacuation by ship begins. There is other maritime news this week. On September 27th, the first Liberty ship, Patrick Henry, is launched from the Baltimore Naval Yard. These ships will be, to a large extent, prefabricated, and the time between them being laid down and launched is greatly reduced. Patrick Henry did take eight months to build, but the average will eventually drop to six weeks. The idea is to quickly make up for tonnage the Germans sink. On the 28th, convoy PQ-1 leaves Iceland for Archangel. It's the first British convoy of war supplies to the USSR. On the 30th, Winston Churchill announces that the whole week's tank production is being sent over. Actually, the first Moscow conference takes place this week from the 29th through the 1st. It has to do with the US and Britain supplying the USSR. In Moscow, the Anglo-American mission headed by Lord Beaverbrook and Averill Harriman was finding out what Russia required and doing its utmost to meet Stalin's requests. It was the Americans, for example, who were able to satisfy his appeal for 400 tons of barbed wire a month. On September 30th, Lord Beaverbrook agreed to send Russia the whole of Britain's share of her forthcoming supplies from the United States. 1,800 fighter aircraft, 2,250 tanks, 500 anti-tank guns, 23,000 Tommy guns, 25,000 tons of copper, 27,000 tons of rubber, and 250,000 soldiers' greatcoats. In nine monthly deliveries, the Soviets are to receive a total of 1,800 British Hurricanes and Spitfires, 900 American fighters and 900 American bombers. For the Red Navy, 150 Aztec sonar sets, 1,500 naval guns, 3,000 AA machine guns, and eight destroyers are to be sent by the end of the year. There's more. For the Red Army, the list of immediate requirements to be provided was staggering, including 1,000 tanks a month together with a proper complement of accessories and spare parts, 300 anti-aircraft guns a month, 300 anti-tank guns a month, and 2,000 armored cars a month together with their anti-tank guns. The British and Americans promised to supply 4,000 tons of aluminum a month, 13,000 tons of steel bars for shells a month, copper, tin, lead, 
brass, nickel, cobalt, industrial diamonds, machine tools, rubber, wool. Britain will send 400,000 pairs of army boots per month. After an initial shipment of 3 million, the Americans will add 200,000 pairs of army shoes a month. The soldiers will get 20,000 tons of petroleum products a month and medical items on such a huge scale that they include over 10 million surgical needles and half a million pairs of surgical gloves, 20,000 amputation knives, 15,000 amputation saws, 800,000 forceps, 100 portable x-ray machines, over a million doses of newly discovered antibiotics like MNB693, which you may also call sulfapyridine, heart and brain stimulants, and a thousand kilometers of oil cloth for protecting wounds. That's a lot. It would be a lot even if the USSR did not produce much itself, but it is still a production powerhouse. The German armored pincers, which encircled and crushed the Soviet armies in Western Russia in June, July, and August 1941, were instruments of military victory such as the world had never seen, but they were not instruments of total victory. Although they destroyed one of the Soviet Union's principal means of making war, its mobilized frontline defenses, they did not succeed in destroying the industrial resources in the European provinces. And this is of ginormous importance, for as the Panzers rolled on for hundreds of kilometers, the Soviets were evacuating their war industry eastward, a huge undertaking under the direction of Anastas Mikoyan. He had them loading their heavy machinery, their supply stocks and their workforces onto trains and then sent east far beyond the German panzers and planes. From August to October of this year, 80% of the Soviet war industry is on the move. The Germans have taken some 300 factories that produce some sort of war material, but 1,523 of them have been relocated beyond their clutches to the Urals, Western Siberia, the Volga, and Kazakhstan. Factories are still evacuated from Leningrad across Lake Ladoga, even after the city is surrounded. This could prove really bad for the Germans, because Hitler's spectacular campaigns from 1939 to spring this year have a flaw. They are being fought from an economic base that cannot sustain a long war even by trying to kill as many mouths that need feeding as he can. The Babi Yar massacre this week outside Kiev sees 33,771 Jews killed over two days. And in the Black Sea towns of Nikolaev and Kherson, 35,782 Jews and communists are killed. We know these exact numbers thanks to German Operational Situation Report number 101 from October 2nd. There are German complaints, too, of people interfering with their work. On the 28th at Kremenchug, the mayor, Varshovsky, orders several hundred Jews baptized, hoping to protect them. He is arrested and shot. This week also sees the drama uprising against the Bulgarian occupation in northern Greece. This is not particularly well organized and is swiftly crushed, but it leads to bloody reprisals. In fact, over 2,000 people are executed over the next few weeks, and this is not limited to the rebels. 485 are executed just the 29th, in just the two villages where the rebellion began. And that brings me to the end of the week. With the Japanese pushed back in China, the Germans stuck in the north, but launching a new offensive in the center against a desperate enemy, but one that is going to be able to continue to produce and to be massively resupplied, providing he can hold out. The Soviets had and have a huge numbers advantage over the Germans, but the Germans have, generally speaking, had the advantage in equipment and training. The Soviets, though, have been getting on-the-job training for three months now, and if they are able to get their hands on all of that equipment, well, it might be a bit of a different war. To understand more about the Babi Yar massacre, you can watch our most recent War Against Humanity episode right here. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Alex Herdemann. It is the Time Ghost Army that makes all of our shows possible. So join us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Do not forget to subscribe. See you next time.